Well, first of all, thank you very much, uh, and good afternoon. Uh, it's a great honor for me to be here. Uh, before I begin, let me take this opportunity to thank the organizers of the UNU Wider for organizing this event uh, for us <coughs> to present our work. The topic that they choose, uh, learning to compete, is also very timely and uh, closely related to the lime manufacturing in Africa project at the World Bank. Uh, the project is conducted by a team of researchers, um, and I'm the head of that group. Uh, but I must say that um, uh, this work, if there's any credit, it should go to the whole team. And uh, I'm just presenting here because they're not here. Uh, today I will talk first a bit about the finding of our project which has culminated in a number of books um, which have been published or are about to be published. Two of them, uh, uh, I brought two of them here, but you can find them online and I'll give you the website that you can access for free. Um, the project objective is to find practical ways to help Africa grow the manufacturing sector. Um, again, uh, I first will talk about the background for the project then we'll talk about the methodology uh, and the findings, uh, and then illustrate the analysis with the example of the latter subsector in Ethiopia before turning to policy lessons. Uh, first, the background of the study, uh, and that's the, the outline of, our, of uh, my talk. Um, I think from this session this morning, um, we don't need to really uh, reveal why Africa needs industrialization. I think John and his colleague this morning have uh, given very good uh, rationale why Africa needs industrialization. Uh, but quickly, it's the fastest way to raise per capita income. And secondly, no country in the world has become an advanced economy without going through industrialization, especially the production of lime manufacturing. And even the resource-based countries need manufacturing to create jobs and prosperity. So with that in mind, how, how is Africa's performance in industrialization? Well, we know that in the past uh, decade, Africa GDP has accelerated to 5.2% per year, compared to minus, uh, uh, to minus 0.8% in the previous decade. And per capita income grew at 2%. However, most of this growth comes from commodity exports because, as you know, uh, commodity prices have gone up in recent years. Africa investment remains very low, less than 15% of GDP, and 80% of the workers remain in low productivity jobs. So the recent economic growth is not likely to be sustainable, and more importantly, it doesn't generate the kind of jobs that Africa would need especially the one that the younger um, African would aspire to. On the other hand, simple labor-intensive manufacturing have been shown to offer employment creation and structural transformation for many Asian countries. And this is the right time because real wages increase in China are forcing many enterprises over there to start looking abroad for possible relocation. <coughs> In our study, we look at five subsectors. We look at apparel, leather product, wood product, metal products, and agribusiness. And um, the case studies are Ethiopia, Tanzania, Zambia. We use China as a benchmark and Vietnam as a comparator. Uh, for more details, uh, I would invite you to go into the website because we have uh, close to 1,500 pages of detailed information on our study. And because of the uh, time constraint here, I will not be able to go into detail uh, in many of these. Okay. The key contribution of our study is in its uh, methodology. Um, the study is based on uh, five different um, sources of information or surveys. Four of these are original work done by the study team so that they generate original and new data for the analysis. 
in the qualitative surveys, we went over to all five countries. We interviewed about 300 enterprises, both formal and informal, uh, using the questionnaire uh, designed by Professor John Sutton at the London School of Economics that you heard this morning. Uh, we went to the flow factories. We visited the showrooms. We went to see private bankers, government officials. And here's a picture of uh, our visit uh, in China. Then we have a quantitative survey that was carried out by Professor Marcel Fairchamps and Simon Quinn of Oxford. Uh, that covers about 1,400 enterprises uh, on the same, again, on the same five countries and covering five subsectors. We also have the comparative value chain and feasibility study carried out by uh, GDS, a consulting firm in Dresden, Virginia, based on in-depth interview of about 300 enterprises, medium size. Again, in all five countries and uh, covering the five subsectors. So we use exactly the same team, same methodology covering all five countries. And in that analysis, we are able to uh, compare across continent countries across uh, both Asia and, and Africa. We also have the Kaizen study carried out by our colleagues at GRIPS and Professor Tesushi Des, uh, um, uh, Sadobe here um, participated in that. That study covers about 550 SME in Ethiopia, Tanzania, and Vietnam. Finally, we also have the World Bank Enterprise Survey, but that survey is fairly common uh, to, to, and so I won't, I won't go uh, into any of this uh, stuff. Basically, four out of five of these are new and original data generated by the, by the uh, world. <clears throat> on the basis, so let me quickly go over the main findings. Um, on the basis of the evidence, we find that Africa indeed has a potential to create millions of productive jobs um, on the basis of, first of all, low wages. Ethiopian wages are about half of the Vietnamese and one-fifth of the Chinese in, la in the latter subsector with roughly the same productivity in well-managed firms. Um, Africa does have natural resources, excellent, uh, excellent uh, weather um, that uh, produces good leather, and I will talk a bit about that later on as in terms of the inputs to the leather industry. Um, we have pri privileged access to high income markets for exports. And finally, growing domestic and regional market uh, propelled in part by the uh, good recent economic growth. However, the industrial structure of Africa is currently characterized, especially in, in the countries that we study, by um, a large number of low productivity, very small informal enterprises which exists side by side with a few medium large enterprises, mostly FDI and SOE. What that means is that for structural transformation to take place, the productivity of both types of enterprise could need to be improved. Uh, at a broad level, uh, furthermore, we have a vicious circle of pervasive poverty and low industrialization. Uh, even under the most optimistic scenario, most African countries can only meet modest targets in infrastructure needs after 20, 30 years. And part of the problem is not just the poverty, but also the geography of Africa. You have a low population density, low rate of urban urbanization, large number of landlocked countries, and numerous small economies. So you need to break out of this vicious circle through a targeted approach. At a broad level, and in the three African countries and across uh, the five subsectors, we find the six major constraints uh, as a binding constraint for the lime manufacturing. These include input costs and quality, industrial land, finance, trade logistics, entrepreneurial skills, and worker skills. These constraints vary by country, by sector, and by firm size. So policies to address these constraints have to be specific, and you cannot have one size fits all. Um, it has two implications. First, policy makers need to 
do the work to find out what the specific constraints are in each of the subsectors in order to design policies to remove them. Second, once they, design, once they identify the constraints, the list of these constraints becomes very small in numbers and it can easily be addressed, um, which can lead to reform momentum, which can then lead to further reforms. This is in contrast with the past studies uh, of Africa growth potential, which inevitably come up with a long list of constraints. You have infrastructure problem, education problem, corruption problem, red tape, and so on. We believe that narrowing this analysis through our approach can make the reform agenda much more manageable within the financial and human resources constraints of most African countries. Uh, in this slide, we show how using this approach we can come up with a matrix of binding constraints for Ethiopia by subsector and by firm size. Uh, the red cells indicate the critical, the most important uh, policies, that, uh, the most important uh, issues that you need to resolve in, the, um, in Ethiopia. The yellow one means important, which is the next order of priority. And then when you have a blank cell, it means you don't have to worry about it. Uh, we won't have time to go in detail um, into these constraints, um, but I advise you to go through uh, the book uh, on Ethiopia that um, this is the book on Ethiopia, which details, uh, which provide details on uh, these constraints and how to address these constraints. Um, with the time limit that I have, let me quickly go over to the second row, which is a leather product. A leather products here is one of the input industries, and as you see, it's critical for both smaller and larger. Um, the leather industry in Ethiopia employs 8,000 workers with $8 million of exports. Okay, that's back in 2010. Uh, Ethiopia also has the second largest livestock population in, Ethiopia, in uh, Africa after uh, Sudan. Uh, but you compare that to uh, Vietnam that currently has, well, for the same year, has 600,000 workers and uh, exports of roughly two to three billion dollars. That was back in 2010. Right now in 2013, that number is about six billion dollars a year in terms of leather products, okay? Ethiopia labor costs are lower than Vietnam. And uh, as I mentioned, Ethiopia does have the second largest uh, cattle population. So the most binding constraints for um, Ethiopia's leather industries are the three factors. First, there's poor disease control that affects the quality of the skin. Second, is a lack of the quality processing of the raw hide. And third, is a trade policy that affects the availability of leather. Once you find out these three basic constraints in the leather subsector, then solutions come almost immediately in order to uh, treat the ecto parasite, which is, a, which is a disease affecting the skin of the uh, livestock. Um, the USID has come up with a, um, with a scheme that can reduce the incidence of this ectoparasite from 94% down to 5%. And the cost, the total cost per annum is roughly $9.5 9, 9 million, which is not big. I mean, if you think of this in the scheme of the exports that, that uh, Ethiopia could easily get to Vietnam level of two, three billion dollars a year. And you know, 9.5 million dollars treatment is, is not large. Second, uh, on the um, lack of quality processing, in the case of uh, Ramsey uh, footwear product in Ethiopia shows that uh, with some technical assistance, from the um, Indian Institute of Leather, uh, which provide technical assistance to seven factories in Ethiopia. Uh, one of them, the Ramsey uh, factory, then was able to triple production within 18 months and was able to export to the Italian market 
So this issue of the lack of quality processing of raw high can easily be uh, rectified with some technical assistance. And third, the trade policy on processed leather. Um, we believe that if uh, Ethiopia allow export and imports of raw hide and processed leather to help alleviate this constraint, this would solve the problem. And we had a discussion with the government last year, and they basically agree uh, with that. So, um, so that's the the um, the, the leather uh, study, uh, the leather case. In terms of policy implications. Uh, again, as I mentioned before, uh, because the binding constraints vary by sector and by firm size, policymakers need to identify, prioritize, and remove the most serious constraints. They need to target policies selectively uh, in line with the comparative advantage and capability. Uh, but let me now go over to some of the uh, policy lessons from our study, which comes out in a different book. Uh, in fact, the book is called Tell from the Development Frontier, uh, where we study how China and other Asian uh, countries have resolved the binding constraints uh, specific to uh, lime manufacturing. Um, and in that book, we discuss the general solutions, which is in industrial parks, uh, industrial clusters, and trading companies. For each of the, sub, uh, each of the constraints, China also had some specific solution, which we also discuss in this book, but then we, I don't have enough time to go into details, but um, let me quickly mention that and I'll give you the reference. So what are the, probably what are the major policy lessons from our study on, uh, uh, on, on Asia? First one is we need to create a supportive environment for manufacturing, and by Create uh, by supportive environment. I don't mean the same terminology that has been used over and over again. You know the uh, the, the so-called uh, doing business and that type of thing. And I completely agree with John that this, this that type of thing is really useless because if a country is able to solve all all the problems in the doing business, then it would become a developed country overnight. So you know, so why you know why talk about about industrialization? Um, second area is a filling knowledge and financial gaps through direct foreign investment and network. Third is using substitution policy and sequencing. Fourth is starting small and building gradually. And finally, establishing islands of success by keeping targeted policies selective and within the country's limited resources. So again, I go quickly on each one of them. On creating a supportive environment for manufacturing, First, we believe that it's very important to have a public endorsement of private sector initiative. And so it doesn't cost the government much, but it's to come out and to say openly that it's important to have a private sector initiative and the, how important it is to have a private sector growth, that's very important because the risks are extremely high in, in developing countries. So for a private investor to start doing business, they need to have that risk reduced. We also find out from, China, from the China study that the Chinese actually did not pick winners, but they basically back winners. They let the private uh, initiative start first, and then they support the one that wins, the one that seems to have a, um, doing, seem to be doing well. Competition is a key in, in our study of, the, of China. And again, I mean, this is a, a cliche, Maintain, uh, maintaining conducive macro and trade policy. It seems like a cliche, but it is indeed very important in, in, in the work. In fact, we study uh, roughly 30 cases of uh, industrialization in uh, Asia and Africa in, in that book. And virtually, uh, this confirms the, the need to maintain uh, discipline in macro and trade policy. And finally, this is, I think this comes back to many of the discussions we had in the last two days. Neither the private sector nor the public sector can drive the process independently, and success requires public and private cooperation. Uh, FDI, I mean, you could talk about how China actually industrialized through FDI, because all of these uh, ideas, all of this knowledge coming from Hong Kong and from uh, Taiwan. In fact, um, there was a study that says that um, 
you could uh, look at the correlation between uh, you could actually determine how fast China moves by looking at the distance it is from, from, from Hong Kong. So it's just to show you how important it is. Substitution policies and sequencing. Economists, especially in the West, don't uh, want to look at the um, uh, second best policy. These are second best policy. And they actually work in, in, in uh, Asian countries. And there's no reason why they don't work in, in Africa at all. The industrial park, the industrial cluster, and the trading companies. Again, uh, and another study, with, another finding uh, that we came up with was that the, there's a need to look at the final goods uh, first, rather than looking at the upstream and downstreams. Take the case of Zambia. It, it does have a, a comparative advantage in the production of cotton. But should you go into the upstream activities of cotton processing? Not yet. I think the most important thing is to have uh, uh, the uh, garment sector first in order to create employment. Then gradually, you could go into upstream or downstream because these are more capital intensive. Um, starting small and building gradually. This is very important. Uh, again, I give the example of Ethiopia, uh, and that's also illustrated through uh, the development of China's light industry. Establishing island of success. Uh, the work that we did shows clearly that production and exports of light manufacturing can expand without solving all the problems of a developing country. I mean, I, I go back to the, to, to the doing business thing, you know, you can't solve all the constraints in a developing country. Uh, and this approach allows the government to design concrete packages of specific, feasible, inexpensive policy to jumpstart uh, industrialization. And we apply that uh, approach uh, in three countries. This is the book on Ethiopia. Um, in, uh, in about four weeks, there's two other books coming out on Tanzania and on Zambia. And then uh, in August, the book on China will come out. So we have at least three books uh, uh, along the same, uh, uh, within the same uh, project. So thank you very much. Uh, and this is the website that you could go into to, to find uh, information. Thank you.